Hi, I'm Bob McCauley, Superwire, and this is Superwire TV. Welcome to another episode of Around Leisure World. And today we have a very uh, outstanding talent that we're going to talk to, and uh, Joseph Valentinetti. Cool. Joseph, great to, to hear from you. And I understand you've done a lot of things with respect to show business and uh, writing, novel, uh, producing plays and things like that. Or at least you're going to do one here at Leisure World, which we'll talk about at the end of the session. Uh, give us a little overview of your background. Okay, Bob. Well, I went to school in, uh, in Minnesota, University of Minnesota. I got my BA and MA degree there. I taught at the University of Minnesota for a while, and I've had kind of an eclectic life. I, what did you teach there? At, I at taught uh, radio and television and film and photography. Okay, did anybody there go on to do some important stuff that your students? Uh, none of my students, no. So George Clooney and people like that weren't one of the <laughs> No, they weren't in my classes. Okay. It would have been nice to have them, but they probably would have taken up uh, too much time. So you spent most of your time at the university there? I spent a lot of time at the, at the university there, working with undergraduate students, mostly freshmen and sophomores. Uh -huh. Producing plays? No, uh, making short movies, teaching them about film, teaching them about photography. It was a time when uh, photography was on film, and film was on film. There was no video, uh -huh. or very little. It was black, and video was black and white and on big reels. Your job would have been much easier if you'd uh, had this type of equipment that we're working with today. It would have been. It would have been easier on the students as well. You know, you gave a student assignment in, uh, in photography, and they would go out and shoot one roll of film, like 36 pictures is the most you could get on a roll, and then they'd have to get it processed and go over the pictures themselves, and it was really limiting in terms of the expenses that they had, and plus they had to... Uh, they didn't have the opportunity, like with digital, to shoot thousands and thousands of pictures. So you've been uh, you you've been involved with teaching uh, film, that type of thing. You've also written some novels, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Right. And uh, you're going to present a play at Leisure World. Yeah, we'll be doing a play called "I Am Diving." I am diving. Yes. Okay. This is about one of the Olympic swimmers or no. divers. <laughs> No? That's an interesting idea. I should try that next time. But I am diving is a, a command used by submarine captains. Just before they're about to take submerge, they call to their sister ship, the ship that's uh, shadowing them, to tell them that they're about to dive uh -huh. and to get so that everyone's coordinated and they have the consent of their sister ship to go ahead and dive. So did you? How did you get your experience with respect to the mechanics? the engineering, the technology of, of, of submarines? Um, just from reading, I have no direct experience from submarines. I was never a sailor. But I was always, I've always been fascinated by submarines, and I was fascinated especially by uh, the Thresher, one of the first atomic submarines in the Navy's fleet. And when was the Thresher built? Um, well, it was first launched in the early 60s. And it's, uh, it's, it's, boy, it's, it's shakedown cruise was in uh, April of 63, when it went from the shipyards in Portsmouth out into the Atlantic. And tell us a little bit about how you got into this idea of, of having, writing a play. What, what was the background? What were some of the things? When was the first time you thought, hey, maybe I should do something with that. Was it to write a play? Was it to write a book, to have a movie, or what? Well, the first thing that happened was uh, I was a writer, and I had written my first novel, Glint, and I had an agent in... Uh, That's G-L-I-N-T? G-L-I-N-T. Okay. And I had an agent in, in uh, Pacific Palisades, and I would visit her from time to time and talk about projects we were going to work on, and her husband was a professor of philosophy named Richard Popkin, who had written a novel in the 60s called Second Oswald about the uh, assassination of uh, This was a Kennedy. conspiracy type? It was a conspiracy type book talking okay. about the possible conspiracies that could have taken place at the time. And he had some letters from an engineer who worked for the fir one of the firms that 
made parts for the Thresher and for atomic submarines. And the engineer claimed that his company had falsified the depth curves. Wow. And did that get public? Uh, how did you find out the, this information, to, or verify this information, rather? Well, I have the letters, and, the, and I have the postal proof that they were mailed. The post office proofs ah. of mailing. Okay. So this gave you the idea. This gave me the idea. His letters to, like, uh, he wrote to then Governor Connolly, who had formerly been the Secretary of the Navy. He wrote to Robert McNamara. He wrote to John Tower in Texas. He wrote to the uh, various admirals in the Navy who might have some power over this to try to warn them that the depth curves for the submarine had been falsified and that when they took the submarine out, it would more than likely have problems. Mm -hmm. So was this one leap into a play, or did you have other thoughts of maybe a book or something? I like wrote that? a novel of it first. Ah, okay. By the same title, I Am Diving. Uh -huh. And when did you publish that? That novel was published uh, two years ago. Oh, okay. And then, what did you, you did not teach playwriting. No, right? I did not. How did you find out about how to write a play? Because writing a play is much different than writing a book. It is different than writing a book. and. Um, the method that I used was I read 200 plays. Ah, okay. I just read as many different plays as I could by as many different playwrights as I could. I read mostly uh, compendiums or compilations of plays that they used to teach for playwriting. Ah. So it, it kind of gave me some insight into how to write uh, a play. What's your favorite play that you read about? Oh boy, I don't want to be too trite, but Hamlet, I guess. Ah, okay. <laughs> Because wow. it has a play within a play. Mm -hmm. and it's a so now you, you started to write the play, and then how long did it take you to do that? Writing the play um, took about a year and a half, and many, many revisions. And I'm still revising it now, as a matter of fact. We're doing it as a, as a play here at, at Leisure World, but we're doing it as a radio drama, not as an acted out play, but just as a reading of a script by various actors. So it's more like listening to the radio than it is. Ah, okay. So I've had in this in this version of the play. So you didn't have to make up a mock up of a submarine. No. Oh, okay, that that would have made it complicated. And I didn't need 129 actors to be the sailors <laughs> either. I, sa I saved that part on it, but I had to add a narrator uh, to the script so that there was someone to describe the action as it was going on, where the dialogue wasn't able to carry that. How do you work the sound? Is this, I assume that the sound has got to sound like a radio. Yeah, we're using four microphones, uh, and the actors are sharing them to a piece, to the microphone. They're sitting at a long table um, and just acting their parts. Now, do they get excited during the play? They get excited. Uh, they get into the part. They, they believe in their characters. We've been rehearsing for... Uh, two or three weeks now, about six or seven hours a week. Uh, so now, this is really based on some real things that happened, some real conspiracy things, groups that got into this? Or well, how yeah. much, Where does the fiction start? Well, the fiction is the, the character, the lead character in the play, Jack York and his wife, and the bar they own. Um, there's a, a part in the play that plays the engineer who wrote the letters. So most of what he says is correct. It comes directly okay, from the like letters. a real person in a play, in, in a, a novel. Play. Okay, you know, okay. And the, the incident, the sinking of the Thresher in, in 1963 is an actual fact. And the assassination of the president in November of the same year is an actual How fact. How many months apart? They're from April to November. Ah, okay. And so now, now you're into it. You've got the, 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 the background. You've done the studying and you're writing the play. And then, um, what, what made you decide to do it here? Well, I wanted to, I was looking for a place to workshop the play, which is what we're doing. And workshopping simply means that the, the play is not a finished product, that it needs more work to be done to it. And that the actors and the other people involved help you realize what that is. Mm -hmm. It helps a writer realize right. where the strengths and weaknesses are. Right. So as the process has gone on, the play has been pretty much completely rewritten. Uh -huh. uh, 
much taken out, other things put in, uh, dialogue switched around, uh, in some cases characters reinvented. What's it going to be like on this play? Are, you gonna, are people going to get upset? Are you going to get mad at somebody? Some groups going to get you're going to get mad at some government uh, organization? Um, well, I don't know. I'm just trying to present um, two factual events with some fiction to try to make sense out of the uh -huh. two events and how they might relate to each other. It's going to give any sadness. I think it is a, a basically a, um, a sad play that this was not a happy time in America. '63 started out as a happy year and ended as a pretty unhappy year. I mean, when we started out, uh, Leave it to Beaver was number one in ratings on, this, on television and tied with uh, the Andy Griffith show, you know. Ruby and the Romantics were singing, Our Day Will Come. Wow. And uh, wow. Jack Kennedy and his wife were living in a place called Camelot. Hmm. And by the time the year was over, it was a very different America. And you give a little picture of that scenario. Yes. Okay, well, let's talk about the play. Let's, uh, I think the, the term is treatment. Can you give us a little treatment of the play, Step, sort of an outline of what, what the play is, without giving away all the, the good things? Well, I'll try. Um, act one is an introduction to the characters, of course, and to the idea, um, and the engineer, and his uh, complaints about the uh, depth curve that was set for the submarine and to set up the characters and let the audience know just who these people are. And this depth curve had to do with pressure? It has to do with the pressure depth curves. The, the amount of pressure that would be exerted on the hull of the submarine depending on the depth that it sunk in the ocean. And the depth curves were claiming that the submarine could go deeper than it actually could go. Before it collapsed? Before it collapsed. Imploded, I guess, is the... Imploded. In other words, they... Um, these are made up numbers, but they... If the depth curve said it could go a thousand feet, it could actually only go six hundred feet. Right. So when it tried to go below six hundred feet, it would there would be a disaster. Real quickly, how what would be the scenario, like a micro scenario of the imploding of a submarine? What would you see if you saw that? If you had a like a little microscope that would go down and look at that, what would what would happen during that time? Oh. I, this is a terrible thing to, <laughs> to think about, but uh, would it happen all it of would, a sudden? It would collapse. And so I, no, it begin the creak. It would begin to make noises, um, sound like it was starting to come apart. Rivets would start to pop. And about that time, people start are starting to, to look at each other and look for help to each other. Well, I think if, if think, uh, the Navy personnel in the Navy are pretty well trained, you know, so you kind of stick to your task. As, as closely as you can, um, always thinking that the, it's going to turn out, you're going to be able to overcome this problem. So I don't know that there was that much panic until maybe perhaps the very last second when the hull started to come apart and collapse inward on itself. So they would probably drown? Um, I would imagine they'd be crushed. Crushed. Crushed by pressure then? Yes. And that would be an excruciating uh, scenario. Um, yeah. It's not an easy thing to think we, about. Unless you were a diver, you would never even know what that would be like. I assume that if anybody that's in a submarine, uh, like like that that thresher, would have been trained and would have been sensitive to pressure and had a little bit of an idea about what was coming, what was going to happen. Yeah, they'd understand what it would be like. I, I think it takes a special type of person to be in a submarine. It's it's uh, you go inside a. 129 people inside something that's not all that big, if you've ever seen a submarine. The right. atomics are bigger than regular submarines, but not that much bigger. Uh, you're brushing up against somebody else all the time. You're, you're working in a very tight environment, and uh, you're working. It's round-the-clock work. It's not uh, get there at 8 and quit at 5. It's someone has to be doing some of the work all the time. Well, I was in a submarine one time and I, in Coronado, and I remember we went out to sea, and my first thought for the first hour and a half was, this thing could just sink, <laughs> and we could have water in here. And then after a while, you get used to it, and now you're laughing and talking and mm -hmm. things like that, and you're you know used to it. Okay, but we have a little conspiracy theory. We're talking about a situation where some engineers have made some mistakes, and some politicians or management type people 
have covered up those mistakes? Some combination of that, yeah. Some mistakes were made in, in, uh, in creating the original depth curves. And instead of going back and correcting that, because the parts were already made and shipped, instead of calling back those parts and going back and redoing the work that should have been done, um, somebody somewhere decided to just go ahead. Do you have any idea who the culprit was? Who Was it after that that nobody really knew it was going to fail until they were actually in there and then people covered it up? Or did, you're saying they really knew ahead of time this was going to fail? Some people knew ahead of time that there were problems with the depth curves, that there was some trouble in the engineering of the project. But the, the one engineer that knew and tried to be a whistleblower was being ignored by everyone he tried to contact. He contacted Robert McNamara, he contacted Senator Tower, he contacted then Governor Connolly of Texas, he contacted various admirals and people from the uh, chief of staff to try to alert them to this problem. So and you're saying John Connolly knew about this? Well, John Connolly at the time that these original depth curves were approved was the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, so that would, you would think there'd be some people mad at John Connolly. If uh, they, if they felt yes, that I think Yes, I think that he became kind of, after the submarine sank, and 129 people aboard were lost. A group was formed called Justice for the Crew of the Thresher. And Connolly was kind of a target figure for them. They felt that if they had to center the, the blame on someone, that it was, why not the person who was at the top at the time? And that would have been Connolly. So this is sort of a knife-edge path of equilibrium between real life and fiction. And it, sometimes it gets a little mixed up in there. Yes. And sometimes fiction may have the truth that people don't understand. So how, how, how does this thing end up? How do you, well, how do you end the play? Fiction, in, in this case, is the link between the historical facts to try to make sense of them. Um, the, the character, the main character, Jack York, was formerly a Navy man but was put out of the Navy because he suffered from a, a mental condition called dissociative fugue. F-U-G-U-E? F-U-G-U-E. Okay, yeah. what, tell me a little bit about that. Um, it's, a, it's a form of like pan-global amnesia. It's where a person suddenly stops being who they are and becomes someone else. And then stops being that person and comes back to being who they were without any memory of the incident or the disassociation from himself. How do they know that? Does, any, does hypnosis bring them out of that? or They don't know. How do people find out that those people did that? Or did they, by observation? By observation and by, um, it's almost an act of faith because uh, if someone, if your husband or wife, for example, disappeared for four or five days and then came back and acted like they'd never been gone, what would you think? You mean like Michael Jackson's mother or relative? Or whatever, or yeah. Agatha Christie, or you mentioned a Amy Semple McPherson. Yes. Um, they all disappeared for a time and came back and had no memory of where they were. Some people believed them, their little close-knit friends, yeah. but most people thought they were just making it up. Yeah, they were off and having fun. nobody knew about that kind of thing, it could happen. Yeah, they were off having fun somewhere and they didn't want to tell anybody. That's what everybody thinks. Well, anyway, this couple, this uh, man that has the fugue, is, is very bothered by this submarine incident because of his own Navy background. And since he, ha he has the same name as someone who died on the submarine, his last name is the same. So he begins to be contacted by the group Justice for the Crew of the Thresher. And justice. Justice. This group wanted to have justice for the things that happened that were covered up. For the loss of life, yeah. They wanted answers. With evil intent. And well... Justice, what does justice mean? What, what happens is like in those kind of groups, if you've ever been to uh, newly formed political groups, there'll be a table on one side that has communists at it, there'll be a table on the other side that has groups that have nothing to do with it really, but that just associate themselves with it. Mm -hmm. So there's hangers on and there's uh, crazies and there's this type and that type. and in, 
I'm, I can't say for sure who was there at the Justice for the Crew of the Thresher meetings, but there were people there that felt that Connolly was responsible. Now, this somehow, there was a lot of things going on in that year, and certainly, uh, most importantly, the, uh, the Kennedy assassination. Yes. And, and John Connolly was involved with that. Yeah. Does that fit in? Well, it does fit in because in August of uh, 1963, this engineer that is in the play and that is a real person in real life who wrote these letters originally, wrote a letter to um, John Tower of Texas, to Robert McNamara, and to John Connolly, warning them of impending danger. And the letter said this. It said, if you go to Dallas, do not ride in an open car. A disgruntled ex-serviceman with a high-powered rifle. Wow. He named the three salient factors of the crime three months before it happened. The disgruntled serviceman, the high-powered rifle, the open car. Hmm. He was then investigated. He, the Naval Intelligence came to him and the Postal Service sent their top people to him to question him about his knowledge of this and the problem with this. Neither of them filed a report. Mm -hmm. But having him be examined by the postal authorities kind of tells you that he actually did send the letters. So now, part of being a playwright or a novelist uh, is verification. How did you verify this information? Well, just through postal receipts, through the fact that he got confirmations of mailings and signatures for receipt of the letters. And you got to see those? Yes, I have copies of them. You, have, you actually have copies now, then? Yes. Wow. Okay. So, can you talk a little bit about the ending? Uh, well, the ending of the play is, uh, it, uh, it proceeds to the point where um, the, the main character, Jack York, at one of the meetings of Justice for the Crew at the Thresher, begins to disassociate himself and to separate from his uh, normal life. And he f winds up in Texas. He winds up in Dallas at Dealey Plaza. In a dissociated fugue? In a, in fugue? a fugue, in a fugue, in a okay. dissociated state. Wow. And we don't know in the play. We hear gunshots. We don't know if he's fired some of those gunshots. Ah. But we know that when he gets back home, that he has a rifle with him. And when he gets back home, the television is on, his wife is asleep on the couch. And when she awakes, she talks to him, and they... The, the Dallas tragedy is on, unfolding on the television. You can hear that in the background while they're talking. And it doesn't come to a happy ending. There is no real resolution. There's no way to know what he did and what he didn't do. He's unsure of what he did and didn't do. And he's now fluctuating between a fugue state and a non-fugue state. So his, his, his condition is worsening. And his wife's hope is that she can save him somehow. But that's where it ends. Hmm. So you have the play, whoever comes to this play are going to see a table with a people table. sitting around a table and they're listening to... No, in the play, the, the actors are sitting at a, at a table, okay. uh, reading from the script, uh, presenting the information to the audience, just reading the play as though it is being acted out with a narrator describing the action okay. so that you understand the scenes a little better. Okay. And you'll be hearing one of the actors will be reading the uh, reading text that is from what, what it was on television at okay, the time. Okay. And this will be in the background while the other actors are speaking. So you'll be hearing what these two actors are saying to each other plus what's going on on television, on the television. Um, and the, the actor, Jack York, the person who has the dissociative fugue, is interested in knowing what happened to Connolly, what happened to Connolly, what happened to Connolly. And he can't satisfy himself with what happened to Connolly, so Finally, he shoots the television. <laughs> uh, something we'd all like to do from time to time, I think. So the people <laughs> that watch this play are going to be involved with this. This sounds like it's something where you're going to take sides. 
I think that the ending is pretty dramatic. Yeah. And we won't go into that, but uh, you know, one of the things we might do is talk a little bit about your background. And I understand that not only you produce this play, but you've also written uh, several books. I've written several other novels as well. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about one of those novels. What? Tell us about what you. What do you feel is your best novel that you have produced? Well. I hate to say my first one, and no one's going to want to read my fifth one, but um, I'm attached to the first one because everybody's attached to the first thing that they do. That's, that's, uh, uh, it's a success just to get the process done, and the novel is called Glint, G-L-I-N-T, okay. like the glint off a, a bright surface. Like a coin. Or like a, a coin or something like that. Dagger or something like that. Yeah, and I like my novels to be based kind of in, uh, in with some historical context or some real context. And in 1964, the government uh, produced silver dollars again for the first time in, in many years. Um, and they were about to release them when a scandal broke out and the Hunt brothers had tried to corner the silver market in right. Texas. I remember that. By driving up the price of silver. Which they did. And if the government would have released these coins during that time, it would have, they would have been worth more melted than they were as a dollar coin. In other words, you could get a dollar coin, melt it, and get two dollars for the silver, or some amount more than a dollar for the I silver. I remember those times. So they melted down those coins. Um, but this story is based on the idea that the, one of the coins got out of the mint. And 30 years later, um, somebody finds the coin. He finds the coin in the desk of a former mint employee. Who had stolen... The Who had take, slipped the coin out of the mint. Okay. Yeah. And he picks up the coin, not knowing it has any value at all. He only is interested in it because it was minted in the year of his birth. Uh -huh. So he takes it to a coin shop to see what it's worth. And this gets a lot of people interested in the coin, because the coin is now worth several million dollars. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to, a lot of people to know about that. You wouldn't want a lot of people to know about it, especially the people that found out about it. Mm. So the, the remainder of the novel is him uh, trying to get himself out of the mess he's gotten himself into. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, well, you've got this, this one coin that's, this, that's basically the central character in the book. Yes. And that is, is that a good ending? That, uh, can it, you expect to read this book and come up with a good ending? Or is it gonna, is it gonna catapult into another novel? Um, no, this is a, a single story. This stands by itself. Uh, my novels are standalone stuff. Um, of the five, none of them really relates to the other. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's just sort of wrap this up, uh, Joseph, and, and talk a little bit about uh, what people can expect to see when they come to the play. We've talked a little bit about it, but let's just sort of wrap it up in a nutshell. You come to the play, it's where, where is it going to be? It's going to be here at Leisure World in Clubhouse 4. Um, it'll be on the 15th of uh, this month at 7 p.m. What day of the week? That's a Wednesday. Okay, so on a Wednesday at what time? 7 p.m. Okay. And then there's also a matinee on the 21st of August in Clubhouse 4 here at Leisure World at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, let's go over those times again. Okay, the first showing is the 15th of August in Clubhouse 4 at 7 p.m. On a Wednesday. On a Wednesday. Okay. And then the following Tuesday, August 21st, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon for a matinee. Now, are you going to take any comments from people that come to the first play? Anything they want to say, I'd be glad to hear. So people can sort of get involved with this. They're, they're going to be there. Are you going to provide any after the show uh, briefings? Uh, I'd be happy briefings? to do that. I'd well, be happy that'd be to very do that. good. I'd be happy to do that. Any input I can have can only improve my work. Fantastic. And uh, it, we, we're interested, you know, it'd be interesting to see if anybody else was involved with the thresher, with analysis of, of that incident. Be interesting there may to be find some out. Here. There may be here in this, uh, in this community people that do have no, direct knowledge of this. How long is the play? It's about 75 minutes. 75 minutes. An hour and 15. Any breaks in the play? Or? There are no intermissions. So it's a solid hour and a half and... Uh, of a ex very interesting historical event yeah. that's been melded and molded into a fictional what if something could happen. It yeah, could be exactly. it could be real life in real life. 
It could be. You may have got real close to what the real life is. Right? I may have. That would be amazing. But, uh, <laughs> I may have. So, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob. Thanks and, for the opportunity. Great, and we certainly look forward to seeing that. Thanks. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you.